hello and welcome. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. And I am your host, Liv, here with another conversation episode. I I spent a couple of months back in the fall just recording an absurd number of conversations and we are still getting through them. So it's always kind of wild to... <laughs> To like listen back and be like, oh, I talked to this person in like September, but it is fresh for all of you um, and so joyful. But I also just feel like the need to say that because, you know, a lot of stuff changes uh, in that time. And honestly, this one might have even been from August. Like it has been a whole collection, a whole host of recordings, and it has been so much fun. So this week I sat down with Catherine Butner, who is the author of Alcestis. Yes, that's right. Coincidentally, like honestly, completely unintentionally, I had this episode scheduled for right after re-airing my Alcestis episodes. And I just thought, you know, how incredibly perfect. But very appropriately, also, this novel, Alcestis, was actually written like years ago. It actually was first published before even The Song of Achilles. And I think that is so fascinating. That is part of what Catherine and I talked about in addition to just the absolutely incredible and weird story of Alcestis that she turned into this amazing novel. Um, and it utterly it just it's fascinating. Uh, this introduction is unscripted because I'm hanging on by a thread uh, and it was necessary. But it, it absolutely fascinating to have this novel be written before the enormous boom in Greek myth retellings. And that is why it is being re-released or rather was re-released back in September. So it is widely available now, again, now that it is like right back in the zeitgeist. It's also just sort of a fascinating retelling on Alcestis, plays with the sexuality of the characters, all of these different things. And this myth that is just so underrated. I will not try rambling anymore. Just sit back and enjoy this wonderful conversation I had. Catherine and I had a joy of a time by the end. We're It was so much fun. You're going to love it. Alcestis is so cool and weird. Her story is wild. Conversations giving a voice to the very specifically voiceless Alcestis with Catherine Butner. Your book is kind of unique in that you're getting it uh, re- published right or whatever the correct word yeah. is because of yeah. this retelling kind of boom but how old like when did you originally publish it so I mean this is this is strange because it uh, uh, do you want me to just like lay out the book timeline a little bit um yeah it's, sure it's not absolutely. complicated but um because I started this book actually in 2004 <laughs> freakishly enough so almost 20 years ago Amazing. Um, which is a terrifying thing for me to think about for my own mortality. But um, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was it, it was I started it just before I went into my grad program for creative writing and it was my master's thesis. So I was working on it in that program. Um, I finished that program in 2006 and the book sold in 2008 and came out in 2010 originally. So yeah. it really the only retelling that I was super, I mean, there were a few, the only one that I was really aware of, and it came out just before this book did. So I did not read it until much later was um, Lavinia. Mm. Ursula yeah. Le Guin's Ursula Lavinia. Le Guin. Yeah, I and always I forget think, about that one. Oh, it's so good. It's yeah. honestly it's one of my favorites, um, especially pre Madeline Miller. And uh and then I guess Margaret Atwood had done the Penelope ad maybe yeah. at that point, I think. Yeah, that one. But I, I honestly still haven't read it. Um, it's good. So, yeah. 
Yeah, that's well. And then Song of Achilles was like 2011, right? So you really got right. in like right before. Yeah. Yeah. Just before she created the genre and like built the zeitgeist. You know? I, know. I was like, why don't I just publish this book before anyone's paying attention? Well, it's so <laughs> interesting because one, like there there are a number of of retellings, you know, that existed before then, but there wasn't like this the genre that exists now. Exactly. Because like people talk a lot about like Mary Renault, which I have not read any of hers, but I have a couple. And then there's also, and yeah. I'm looking at my bookshelf right now if I'm looking away from me, that's why. Oh, Emily Hauser, I think, had written some before that as hmm. well. Again, which I have not read, but I own. Um, but even Song of Achilles was like big when it came out, but then so much bigger later. It's Agreed. it's kind of fascinating. I also just to uh, connect myself to this before the boom thing started writing a mythological retelling that still does not exist. Uh, but I did start it and finish a first draft in 2008. Um, okay. So I also tried to be ahead of the yeah, game. We were uh, <laughs> we were there. We were doing yeah. it. I you know I think what's interesting about it is the fact that it wasn't I mean people really had no idea how to categorize this book yeah. when it was so you know I mentioned it was done and it was I finished the first you know it was it was ready for publishers to look at it by 2006 and it took 2 years to sell and I think it was partly because I got a ton of feedback from publishers that was sort of this is so lovely we have no idea what to do with it yeah. Uh, and and I really, I think that that was partially, it's, it's really interesting to me to observe how there's essentially been a subgenre created for <laughs> these mythological retellings. And I think even essentially, even sometimes for specifically queer retellings. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just, that didn't exist at the time. And until Madeline Miller's I think it was, I mean, I guess Circe is not as explicitly queer as Song of Achilles. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying to remember. It's been a minute since I read it. but And I love both of them. But I also think that the fact that the book is, it at the time, I think when I told people it was a retelling, they were surprised that it was not a retelling set in a different time. Mm, interesting you know that it wasn't like a modern retelling or like what if you take the story of Alcestis and you put it in um the 1940s or something like that like I think they expected a retelling it was I think it was partly coming out of the sort of 90s like (laughs) I don't know Baz Luhrmann Romeo plus Juliet sort of thing people were like what do you mean (laughs) it's a retelling and nobody's wearing aloha shirts (laughs) you know um so I think people were thrown by the fact that it was a retelling that was in the actual time period and also that it was treating the gods as actually real and present, that they were, mm. you know, that that they that something that we would think of as fantastical was treated as just realist. Mm-hmm. I think that also just wasn't as common then, that there were, if you had retellings, they tended to kind of be like a gritty retelling where you don't know if the gods are actually real or not kind of yeah. thing. Um, well, yeah, so it, I, I think those were two things at the t- that seem completely normal now, and weren't just not as frequent. Yeah, well, it makes sense because you you even think about like Troy, which would have been yeah. fairly recent at that time, yeah. like just completely writes out the gods out of the Iliad. I mean, quote unquote, the Iliad. Uh, well, and, right. <laughs> and, yeah, <laughs> whatever it wants to call the Iliad. Um, it, yeah, so it's interesting. And you know, it's funny you say that because, and like, you know, there are so many now, but I still think the majority of retellings these days don't feature a lot of actual gods, you know, doing super normal things. Like they still tend to focus a lot on the mortals and like not exclusively for sure, but yeah. primarily it's still really heavily on the mortals. Um, okay, before we, like, I could just keep talking about retellings forever, but I want yeah, yeah. you to give, like, an idea about what, well, sorry, now I'm going to jump around. Also, I have ADHD, just a <laughs> warning. No worries. Um, but, um, so one, just to, to point of clarification for my listeners, I'm going to say Alcestis because I always had, have, but I recognize that Alcestis yes. is also a valid pronunciation in English. Um, but Alcestis is such a unique play Mm -hmm. to choose, like of Mm -hmm. all of Greek mythology. uh, So my background on Alcestis is that I had not read it until uh, a year, year and a half ago. Um, 
I just kind of assumed it was like, you know, like any other Euripides play. And he is notoriously my favorite. I will defend him to within an inch of my life. Uh, but I, I just had not read Alcestis and just thought it was kind of like all the others. And then I read it and I just lost my mind because it is the most bizarre and weird yeah. and like just magnificent play but like yes yeah why Alcestis and like it's just so specific and also not well known so I just want to hear more about like that part absolutely yes and I will probably go back and forth because I was also used to saying Alcestis I was a classics major in a Greek focus of course in undergrad and um and then I've just had to accustom myself because all the book people wanted it to you know they wanted to romanize the spellings Ugh. and they wanted to I know. But at the time, again, this wasn't a thing. So oh, I think yeah. I bet I bet I could have won that fight now. Um, but at the time I was like, but my K's, my K's. Yeah. You know? Well, especially <laughs> that one. Because that one's right. like, you know, there's a lot where it is awkward in English to make us a, yes. a Latinized C a hard sound. Like I get that. But Alcestis feels yes. like that's yeah, that's not one of them. I agree. I agree. So I'm going to probably call her Alcestis for this sure. just because it sounds nicer. Um, I Yeah. So my history with that, too, I was also being a Euripides completist. Uh, I, best. as you do, I was, yeah, because I'm obsessed. Um, my first history of reading the dramatists at all was in high school. I had a really wonderful, weird uh, two period class wh- that was taught by both an English teacher and a history teacher. Oh, and that so sounds they were, so fun. Yeah, it was great. I'm jealous. <laughs> and they decided that we should read all the big three um, of the dramatists at the beginning. And so that was the first time I read Euripides. And it just, especially reading, you know, Sophocles and, um, oh my God, I'm going to blank, which is the most embarrassing Aeschylus. thing to do. Thank you. Um, <laughs> especially welcome. because I actually like Aeschylus because oh, I think he's that's fine yeah yes better than oh god no I don't like anybody better than Euripides but Good. I like that's right I like answer. Aeschylus better than Sophocles because I feel like it, I I mean in in my distant memory my reaction at the time was like look at this just messy drama in Aeschylus and then Sophocles is so focused on I don't know virtue <laughs> You know, I think yeah, um, depending on the plays, because I would like, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> Oedipus Tyrannus is uh, pretty heavily yeah, dramatic, fair. but I also think okay. the way they teach it, you're True. right. Like the, the yes. way they often teach Oedipus Tyrannus is that it's a very different thing from if you just sit down and read it and you're like, this is fucked up, you know, so I, I can see that happening. Yeah, <laughs> that is absolutely true. Absolutely. Yeah. So anyway, I think but when I got to Euripides, it felt I don't know, I think there's I mean, I'm sure it's not a new observation, just that the way that he psychologizes just feels so much more modern and it's easier to connect with. And also the language is so beautiful. And especially once I was actually translating from Greek, I just I just was super obsessed. So yeah. I was actually working my crappy part time job after I graduated from college and reading Euripides on my lunch breaks. And that was when I read the Alcestis. And so I, yeah, I had essentially the same reaction that you did, that I had just been reading it because I was trying to read all the Euripides Mm -hmm. and I was boggled by it and by how weird it was and how, um, how impassioned and believable the fight between Admetus and his father is, but how, how not sympathetic he is in any other way. And just, um, and just by, Alcestis as a as a figure and how absent she is I think um that was what really got me at the time and I was just I was also you know I was like 22 um I was coming out of a fan fiction writing background um so filling in the gaps was something that I was very uh, accustomed to doing and I was just really intrigued by the fact that it was the only harrowing of hell story that I could think of in Greek mythology that has a female character going to the underworld voluntarily Mm -hmm. so you know because you know the Odysseus story and um, Orpheus and there are lots and lots of other instances and Heracles obviously um, there are lots of instances of male figures going to the underworld and making their way back out um, and choosing to be there but I just was really struck by the notion that Euripides was telling this story about a woman who voluntarily went to the underworld and spent three days there at least in surface time 
with a goddess who was kidnapped and taken to the underworld. And that's not in the play at all. <laughs> and that just seemed like such a huge missed opportunity to me. Um, yeah. And not, I mean, not that Euripides misses opportunities. Like, come on, that's not the story he's interested in telling. But I was curious about it. Mm-hmm. I, I love the Euripides defense because <laughs> yeah. the thing about the Alcestis, like one, yes, that's so true. And she is so unique. And like, I think there's, I think I'm sure that people have made the argument that like, you know, she's some kind of missing figure in a way that is like a, a fault of Euripides, but it's so clear how intentional he's being with yeah. it. Like it is a tragic comedy in the way no one yes. of his, no other play of his is like, he is writing this to be funny. There is a moment yeah. where Heracles wrestles death. Like it is funny. <laughs> and so I think he made this point of being like, this woman is dramatic in a way that I'm not focusing on here. Like her story is actually tragic. I'm yes. interested in how absurd her husband is and how much yeah. the man cannot take responsibility for any single thing that he does. <laughs> and right. then, yeah. And meanwhile, yeah, we just get to like imagine what happens with her. So I love the idea of of then focusing on on her as a character in, yeah, because clearly Euripides was like, nah, nah, like I've got weird <laughs> other things to say. Also the fact that it's his earliest surviving play is one of yes. my favorite pieces. Like he's just so weird. I love him so much. <laughs> Yes, agreed. A million percent. Yeah. I mean, again, this is this is another like dating myself pop culture example. But I feel like I was also so f I was the exact same generation of kids who were the age as um, the characters in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Amazing. So yeah, so I went to college the same year they went to college, you know, and then about 10 years later, my students were the same age as the Harry Potter kids. And I have no idea what they're the same age as now. I think they're the same age as their favorite YouTubers. I don't know, whatever. But, um, uh, but it makes me think of I feel like there were a lot of narratives in the 90s, aughts, whatever, that were interested in showing you the sort of minor care like elevating the minor characters in some way mm -hmm. and it makes me think of a particular um i i get a just a pang whenever i think of anything produced by joss whedon at this point because fuck that guy but also I'm uh, <laughs> but also um there was i don't know if you encountered or remember but there was a an episode of buffy called the zeppo that's just like the a plot is happening in the background yeah um and and it's huge and dramatic and things are about to blow up as always or whatever and then there's you know xander's plot that's happening in the foreground and that's the whole point of the episode and it's really clever and charming fucking joss whedon but whatever um so i feel like that there's some like the tragicomic element in the play to me has a bit of that feeling that Alcestis yeah. is having this huge drama and, you know, saying these tearful farewells to her children and even all the, you know, enslaved people and servants in the palace are lamenting and everything. And then Admetus is just up here having a panic attack and, <laughs> and it's kind of funny. Um, yeah. It's very weird. <laughs> Yeah, well, and he's, I'm trying to think of what translation I read and like how much that might have impacted mm. it. Um, because I do unfortunately have to read in translation. I just managed to get a classics degree without learning Greek, but this is all no, for no, me. I, 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 I also have to read in translation at this point. My Greek was like 20 years oh, ago, so well, it's, uh, it's, it's I, pretty much gone. <laughs> I'm constantly hoping still to find the time to learn it, but one of these days. Um, but yeah, I mean, he he's just so interesting in that like, he he is kind of tragic but also like everything yeah. he says is laced with this level of absurdity right. that like it makes him so hard to be like it, it's so hard to be sympathetic towards him right. because every yeah. time he says something that you want to be sympathetic for he follows it up with like something ridiculous and i yes. yeah I, it's just it's such a joyful play and i don't i make sure we don't want to talk about like the only the play um but it it's no, no, just I'm happy to talk about the play <laughs> Yeah, don't worry. I, it's, it's just so good. But Euripides is perfect. So the things, like, what kind of, I mean, I guess I just want to hear more about what your plot is, because, of course, the point that all of this is making yeah. us talking about this is that Alcestis basically does not exist in the play Alcestis. She has, like, yeah. two lines, and that's the point, and it's interesting. And even when she is brought back from the underworld, she doesn't say a single word, and that's so cool and weird. So yeah, like yeah. you would have had this fully like blank character to work with. 
So like, what did you do and why, I guess? Yeah, that's a great question. Right. Because in the play, I mean, her speech, and I think this hits me very differently now. I was rereading the play um, before we talked and her, her soul, first of all, in the play, she has children in my novel. I was like, eh, (laughs) children. I don't, I don't want to deal with the child having aspect of it. Partly because I was interested in her as, I mean, there's no, obviously like historically she could very well have had children and still been essentially a teenager, but, um, but I was interested in the idea of her as a teenager, essentially, mm. that she is still quite young when she's having to make these massive decisions and when she's being faced by these gods who are, you know, all all powerful or very close to it um, and uh, capricious and unpredictable and all of those things. And just, I think, thinking about what it would have been like to be in the social role in Mycenaean Greece of at that period of being essentially not really having much of a social role other than being a trading piece kind of, and then moving into this world where she does have to uh, make decisions for herself. Um, So what I thought about was, I guess what I wanted to do was really to think about that social role. So the first third of the novel follows her as a child and then up until the moment where she marries Admetus. Um, And for me, that was actually, I mean, I loved, I loved thinking about all of it, but I really loved thinking about her actual life as well. um, And what it might have felt like to be living in an environment where not just the, the role of the gods, but also just the restrictiveness of, I mean, one of the things that really struck me, this is, when I talk about what I write, I say that I write historical novels, but this is really a prehistorical novel mm-hmm. because we don't actually have written history that's, you know, decipherable or of useful the <laughs> or useful of the Mycenaean yeah. period. And so and the the even the archaeological evidence that we have is pretty minimal. And and it it I'm always struck when I see thinking about Mycenaean Greece on the Greek mainland, and there will probably be experts who are listening to your show who are like, she's the wrongest. And if that's true, I apologize. But my impression is just that the archaeological buildings and and evidence that we have that remains on the mainland is like, not the grandest, right? I mean, maybe there were some palaces, but, and, and I'm not thinking it like Minoan, you know, there's more, you've got Crete and you've got more, um, more beautiful and dramatic spaces that have been preserved but like when the things that I saw at least I was struck by the fact that like they're made of like mud brick like they're not you know it's have you been to Mycenae sorry no I haven't been to any of these places yet sadly um Mycenae I mean it's not Knossos but like but I think it is one of the few so it is a bigger palatial structure but also I love that they use the term palatial but like I yes. think that the the clarification you're making is like they're I mean yes we use the word palace but like yeah I mean they're they're large structures and yeah. it's so interesting because also the Mycenaeans like took over after the Minoans right like and right. they conquered the Minoans so I think with that a lot anyway um I don't know enough I know age, and you're like how what did you do <laughs> yeah exactly because also like yeah. Knossos is wild anyway right. um but yeah I, yes. I I I Mycenae is so fascinating generally, but also, I mean, I, yeah, I don't know enough to, to, to correct anything. I don't so really well. either. I, I am not well. an expert. <laughs> I am a novelist and a dilettante. But I <laughs> but I guess what struck me was just that, like, you know, it's it's not the most lush environment. Yeah. And it's not the I mean, it's a pretty hard scrabble in some places. And and the buildings are not what I think when a lot of people just obviously they think of like classical Athenian architecture or something like that if they think ancient Greece. And I just, I, I guess I was just kind of struck by the fact that like, sure, she was, she was wealthy and privileged for her time. And she was still living in buildings that would have been like pretty bare bones to contemporary modern humans. Can you remind Um, me where she was? Um, I mean, she goes to, to, she's in Iolcus originally. And then she goes to Fury. Right. So that's like, yeah, that's even up north too. So you're really working with, yes, you're nowhere near because I was like, okay, how near is it to the Peloponnese? In which case, yeah, like you're dealing with, there's almost nothing found up there. There were certainly bronze age structures, but yeah, yeah, it's not my scene. Right. Exactly. So I just assume that like 
I'm sure whatever was there felt incredibly impressive at the time <laughs> and maybe would have seemed less impressive to someone who's thinking about classical Athens. Yeah. Um, so I, yeah, I just, I was curious to like really think about her life and then to think about, I also, so my background um, academically later is that I have a PhD in 18th century British literature, basically, um, and focused on women writers and the way that that also influenced. So that's what I was reading a lot of as I was revising this novel, which seems like it would have nothing to do with it. But to me, I think it actually did. It was really useful to be reading about a vastly different time period in which nonetheless, like men and women are still super segregated. Yes. And so thinking about like the alien quality of men to like a teenage girl at that time and what it would mean to go from just like a super restrictive environment like that to the underworld where you're dead and no one's watching, (laughs) you know? Um, And, and thinking about how that would relate to like queerness and sexuality and just a feeling of freedom, but also of course, like there's also grief and loss. She's looking for her sister who died when she was a child and, never knew her mother and all of that. So yeah, I guess I was just really interested in exploring all of those things. Um, And the fact that the play does render her such a blank slate just meant that I had a ton of room to do it. Yeah, yeah. But I love all of this. Also, as somebody who like, my BA was a double major in English lit and classics. So like, These things are, I think people would think they're not tied. They're so inextricably tied together, particularly because of the Victorians. We're so obsessed with ancient Greece that like- Well, sure. And like the 18th century is the neoclassical period. Yeah. They're they're obsessed. (laughs) Um, Yeah. So I I don't know. I think I, I, weirdly enough, like I thought a lot about like Jane Austen and Evelina when I was writing this novel in terms of how, like what do a young woman and a- young king actually do when they get in a room together i mean if i had thought more about this i i maybe i would have also anticipated bridgerton i don't know yeah yeah. but i just think that like how freaked out they are is dramatic and interesting yeah absolutely And so, like, my, my listeners know how I feel about uh, some things about Hades and Persephone that I don't talk about all that much. But I do love Persephone as a character. Uh, mm. And I do find their relationship after the Homeric hymn to Demeter to be quite interesting. Um, yeah. So, yeah, like, how how did you want to handle Persephone and Hades and all of that? I would say what I was most interested in regarding Persephone is the idea that she is she has godly powers, but she's also been put in a circumstance where her, her agency and her choice is limited, right? She mm-hmm. has, she has to be in the underworld for a certain time each year. She has to be not in the underworld for a certain time each year. So regardless of where she would prefer to be, it's not her choice. And so I saw her as somebody who would be really fascinated by Alcestis having the ability to choose to go to the underworld and and having the ability to choose I mean we were talking about in the play you know as soon I think the other thing that really inspired me to get into this was how horrified Admetus is as soon as Alcestis stands up and says she'll go and Euripides is is depicting that largely as grief right like he doesn't want to lose his wife but it it seems I and mean, it's clearly also just face saving right it's like mm-hmm. patriarchal honor says you don't let your wife die for you meanwhile and, and you so, asked her so it's right. like yeah like facing that after the fact of like oh well damn i got right. what i wanted how do i handle this now <laughs> Exactly, exactly. And so I think it's as if he doesn't realize what he's doing until it's actually until she's said yes. And then he he does suddenly realize that losing face or um, 
having everyone know that his wife has died in his place is maybe about as just as bad as death. And she actually talks about that too in the speech about her children. She's essentially, I, I think I am remembering correctly that she basically says like, well, what would possibly, you know, what could possibly happen for my children if they had a father who was such a coward? Um, and so anyway, sidebar, but I, I just felt like Persephone would be super interested in Alcestis as a person who made these choices that were leaving the men in her life kind of flummoxed. Yeah. <laughs> that, you know, she had gone to the underworld um, of her own free will. And so the idea of the two of them being in this shared space, but also it's a weird space, right? It's the underworld and Persephone has power there. And, and then I had to kind of figure out like, what does Alcestis have there? You know, is she dead? Is she not dead? That's also true in the play, right? It's like, is she dead? Is she not dead? Who knows, right? Um, So yeah, I think that's, I I wasn't as interested in Persephone and Hades, except for, of course, the fact that if Persephone starts getting obsessed with Alcestis um, in whatever way, like, of course, Hades will be aware of that. He's aware of everything in the underworld. Mm -hmm. Um, To get back to the uh, initiating incident of my reading The Dramatist, One of the teachers in that high school class that I took, when we read the Odyssey as well, he, I remember him talking about, I don't remember if it was Calypso or Circe, um, but he, he was like, well, you know, goddesses happen (laughs) to, to Odysseus basically, right? Like, because he was talking about the, the huge, massive, super obvious double standard of Odysseus and Penelope, right? And that like, obviously you know Penelope has to be like scrupulously guarding her behavior so that none of the suitors think that anything is that she's even open to the possibility of remarriage but like Odysseus you know yes some goddesses like they happen he gets trapped for a while whatever um and I guess I was also really intrigued by the idea of like so Persephone's married um Alcestis is married it's not like that ever stopped any of the gods or the Greek mortal men So, yeah, I think I was just sort of like, well, what if a goddess happened to a young married Greek woman instead? Yeah, that's really interesting because one, I just love the idea of saying goddesses happen when it's like the answer is that one is a man and one is a woman. It's not so much (laughs) Uh about goddesses happening as it is a complete and utter double standard that is just 100 percent what that was. absolutely (laughs) yeah like women had to be pure and men did not that's all there was to it but yes I I, it's a great phrase to uh, like also then to use in this context because it's yeah I mean yeah that's so interesting so like I mean uh, yeah I don't want to like you know give away too much of the relationship I guess but that's sure yeah sure. that's an interesting I mean way it's a queer retelling it. no worries we can talk about it oh yeah yeah, yeah no I just didn't want to like spoil what type of relationship they might have <laughs> so I mean I think that there are more and more queer retellings now but they are still obviously like very much in the minority but yeah. I love the idea that even before Song of Achilles you had this one, but the, one of the most rare things is a queer retelling featuring two women. So I would love to hear more about that particular aspect. And like, I mean, it's so, it's such an interesting thing to have a conversation with you now when you wrote it so long ago. Yeah. But like, I would love to hear about your mindset at the time, but like also sure. writing that in 2008, you said, right? Like even earlier, what a different before, time. Yes. Yeah. Super different time. Absolutely. Yeah. I think, I mean, it is true. I will admit, again, I adore Madeline Miller's books. I think she is amazingly talented. And actually, I think as much as I love Song of Achilles, I think Cersei is actually my favorite. But um, Mm. but I I did have a couple of like slightly bitter thoughts of like, well, maybe if my queer retelling had been some sexy dudes, (laughs) you know, (laughs) maybe it would have been the zeitgeist. So I get it. But also like, I sympathize with that, right? I grew up reading the sexy dude fan fiction, um, largely, which is also definitely more about men than women. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that I, what I thought about at the time, I guess, was just that I didn't want, I wasn't particularly interested in telling 
I don't know. I mean, I think about, for example, like the 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 very necessary um, content note that you have on your podcast, right? That's just like <laughs> sexual assault. It's everywhere. It's Greek mythology, right? And I and I guess I just wasn't like I I don't think it would even have occurred to me to try to retell a um a story that involved a Greek male god pursuing. Yeah. A, a woman because I just was like no thank you know like I didn't want to try to I don't even know what you would do to make that not icky um yeah. yeah and so it felt like there was a lot more space like in a relationship between a goddess and a woman there was a lot more space to think about what that would mean in terms of in terms of consent in terms of um dynamics like power dynamics between the two of them more broadly because Mm -hmm. again there are like things that Alcestis has that Persephone doesn't which is mortality um, eventually the the opportunity to go back to being alive again in a simple way without restrictions um, and and agency just the choice of having having gone there herself and so Mm -hmm. it seemed like it would be a little bit more complicated and I also think that the other thing that really that I thought about a lot in terms of what the life of a young person growing up in a world where the gods really are functional forces in your everyday life is that so much of that is also, I mean, what I observed from the stories anyway, so much of it is about um, unintended consequences and trickery. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, even just the earlier parts of Adventus' story, right, that like Apollo is, he, he is a favorite of Apollo's because he was kind to Apollo when Apollo was in the role of a cowherd or a shepherd or whatever and was taking care of his because he was being punished. So like there's always the sort of, you know, the hospitality requirements and not not treating people, strangers poorly because it might actually be Athena and just like fucking with you or whatever. (laughs) Um, And I think that I was, I've always also been interested, like in this new edition of the book, there's also a little tiny piece of flash fiction that I wrote about, um, about Selene. That's because the other things that always stuck with me were the stories of the female, you know, divine figures who went to Zeus and asked for their lovers to live forever. And instead they were like grasshoppers or they slept forever. And that there are just so many ways that you don't actually get what you want Yeah, in these stories. Um, especially if you're a woman, I think. <laughs> <laughs> the story of my podcast. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I think I just was so much more interested in, in, in women's roles than I was Mm -hmm. in, in just like the gods, I guess, broadly. Yeah. Well, and, and like having it be a goddess like Persephone is so interesting because like you said before, though, to the listener, I'm not a hundred percent sure how much you'll have said in stuff that I've kept. Um, But Persephone being a goddess who is, you know, not there willingly, who has been, I know listeners who has been abducted by Hades um, and brought there against, against her will. Um, Like that's such an interesting thing because, you know, as I also will admit still, like she does take on that role for all that she was brought there against her will. She becomes the dread goddess Persephone. Like she takes her lot and she's like, fuck you. I'm going to become like the most powerful goddess. I'm going to absolutely dominate over Hades at every possible opportunity. Like I'm trying to think of which it must be. Oh yeah. I mean, it's just the Odyssey where like, it's all Persephone happening. Like there's so little access. Most of the times when anybody's in the underworld, it's like Hades who this is the dread goddess, you know? So yeah, working with her. Yeah. So interesting. So like, I mean, what did you want? her to be like or what did you make her like I don't know I want to hear more about your Persephone because she's cool (laughs) sure yeah I mean I think of her I I definitely thought of her as a in that role right in the sort of dread goddess role Mm -hmm. Um, but nonetheless still appearing as a kind of vulnerable figure like I think that's what's so interesting about her is that she Mm -hmm. has this origin story that suggests vulnerability like being vulnerable to you know, whether it's persuasion or abduction or or whatever. Right. And, 
And then she takes on the role that she is given. It just seems like that's also like, I don't, I don't know how to not see that as kind of metaphorical for like the ways that women were allowed to operate in society at the time. Oh, right? yeah. It's like, yeah, things happen to you. And then you either took on those roles and did something with them or you didn't. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's also kind of the decision making process that Alcestis has to go through in the novel is what do I want to do with, you know, I I made this split second decision to make this sacrifice. Um, And in her case, she also has, I mean, in my novel, she also has the motivation of looking for her sister in Mm, the underworld, which is a separate, it's not the same. She's so clearly motivated in the play by her children I mean, she actually talks to them a lot more than she talks to her husband in the play. <laughs> um, and and so I, I guess, yeah, I just was interested in thinking about how Persephone, I mean, so much is made about Alcestis as the model wife and, you know, the ideal Greek woman mm-hmm. who's so, because she died and sacrificed herself. It's like um, Penelope, and, right? <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. It's just all like self-negation is is yeah. what makes the model woman. And the 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 book does it kind of starts with a frame that considers that that like mm-hmm. you know, Alcestis has heard the story of her birth from people around her and then after the book concludes, we get some of sort of the way that her story gets promulgated, I guess, and like passed mm-hmm. down in different ways. Um but it feels just really similar like so you have this figure who's the ideal self-sacrificing wife, and then you have the dread goddess. And yet, you know, they just, they felt like kind of two sides of the same coin to me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that it, she is so interesting for all of those reasons. One of the things I keep thinking about talking about this, um, this I learned through an episode with Dr. Ellie Mack and Roberts, not the Alkestis episode. I've had Ellie sure. on a lot because she's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Um, but she, she came on to talk about Persephone because she specializes in the underworld. And one of the things she told me was that in, I'm going to forget where it was, but I think partially in, in Sicily. So, you know, the mm. Greek part of Italian yeah. or of Italy, um, there was this whole practice of girls before they were going off to be married of them creating these like tablets, I think, depicting themselves as Persephone in all these different ways. Yes. And like, so things like some of them are going off happily, like welcoming, you know, their new life, Mm -hmm. welcoming them or like, you know, accepting their husband with open arms. And then some of them are terrified and they like depict their own stories through Persephone And it was just like one of the most, I mean, impactful things I've learned about young women in ancient Greece, but also like, I think it says all of these things that you've been saying about Persephone, this idea that like, she is just so many things at once, you know, she's like powerful, but she's vulnerable. She, you know, experienced this horrible situation, but then she became so much more because of it and through it. And yeah, I mean, yeah. she she is just fascinating in that respect, particularly when she does connect with these like real people in that way. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. Yeah, and I think just I I feel as though you know, whatever you think about um her eventual attitude toward her circumstances, I it seems so I mean, there are so many different stories across different kinds of mythology and folktale about not freaking eating the fruit, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Like whether it's the apple or the pomegranate or the fairy food or whatever. And so it seems like she also connects to these other stories about, um, I mean, it's like Persephone to Goblin Market, right? Like it just, <laughs> yes. it's not... <laughs> So maybe it was my reading Victorian stuff. Yeah, I was sorry, just like... reading like too much Christina Rossetti. <laughs> that was my <laughs> All English that degree. Suck my juice and stuff. Back. Oh my god. Oh yeah, my... seriously. Um <laughs> Yeah. So I, I think that it just the way that she is representative or connects to so many other stories about like the dangers of succumbing to a particular place, like leaving aside how she gets to the underworld, once she's there. It's it is actually an action of hers, supposedly that, you know, traps her there. Mm-hmm. And so, 
Yeah, I think that's another element of it too that's that's interesting. And and that kind of ties into the question of of queerness. And this actually makes me think, I mean, one of my favorite, favorite movies of the last few years was Portrait of a Lady on Fire, um, which is so lovely, uh, if any if folks haven't seen it. But it it is so it's a 18th century France. Um, and it's a movie about these two women, one of whom is about to be married and um, a portrait painter, female portrait painter, who is hired to paint a portrait for the potential suitor um, of the young woman who's going to be married. And of course they fall in love and it's very passionate, but done in, done in a very like a very believable, beautiful way that doesn't Mm. feel sort of, I don't know, melodramatic. Um, And it's also just beautifully shot. It's a gorgeous movie, but it's, I mean, I don't want to go too far into spoiler territory, but I think one of the things I love about it is that it's not a movie that, like, it's not a story about, and then they run off together. Right. (laughs) You know, it's a story about having this time in a specific circumstance between two people. And, and I think that that, I mean, A, that like ties into the Persephone myth in a bigger way, right? She's, she only ever has like limited time, but also I was struck by the idea of Alcestis also, uh, and maybe like queerness between women in particular um, at this time or in the ways that we associate with Greek mythology and culture, like being something that she had access to, but in a limited way. That it wasn't as easy as just like, it's not like she falls in love with Persephone and then the rest of the book is just, they rule together. And, you know, it's, it's just, it's more complicated than that. And it's more contingent and constrained, Mm -hmm. but that feels more, I mean, none of this book is meant to just be, you know, it's a retelling. It's not, it's not supposed to be an accurate account of history, but at the same time, it is, I think there are ways to kind of get at some things about like queerness in the gaps. I guess. Mm That's one of my favorite things to just, I feel like I've said it too many times on this show, but my favorite theory, a theory about women, queer women in ancient Mm -hmm. Greece, particularly it would be like ancient Athens, because that's where we have all the records, but also it's where we know that like, you know, women were most constrained. Um, Right. And I, I love the idea that the Greeks were so obsessed with sex being penetrative that they that women could probably go off and hang out with each other and like fool around all they wanted and it they wouldn't have any problem because it didn't count as sex (laughs) absolutely and there's so much history of that i mean if we go if we go back to like the 18th 19th century british connection weirdly enough like one of the things and i so my new novel that just came out that's set in late 19th century us is also it's at a moment it's the moment you know where um, queerness is starting to get pathologized, right? And like sexologists are coming along and being like, wait a minute, romantic friendship between women. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Um, <laughs> hold on. But there's there's a super famous court case that I'm always talking about. So this is um, in the late, you know, late 1800s in Scotland. And it's the basis of the the play, The Children's Hour, if you've encountered that ever. But it was these two women who ran a boarding house and they were accused by a, a female student of doing something inappropriate. Um, and and there's so much more complication here, right? Because the student was actually Anglo-Indian. And like, so there's like race and class stuff and all kinds of stuff. Mm. But they were accused. And the judge's decision, and so the woods Peary case, if anyone's really curious, the judge's decision was, no, how could they have done anything inappropriate? They are English women. <laughs> whoa right you know so this is like late 1800s and he's still just like i do not understand like yeah what could they have done <laughs> you know yeah. um it's literally just yeah it's like what what do you mean women have how do women have sex like that yeah, <laughs> yeah. so it was there and it was it was jurisprudence at the time you know <laughs> 
Um, so I think there's, I think there is that question always of like, what is not visible? Yeah. Yeah. Just behind the scenes. I mean, so mm-hmm. much of what we know about ancient Greece is we know it purely it because men wrote it down. So it's like it, it, so often, you know, people want to make these claims about what didn't happen right. in the ancient world. Or or even like, you know, it comes up with me a lot because I, you know, I cover as many queer stories on the podcast as possible. Um, and they're all men, save yeah. for like the horror that is Callisto. And I can't really think of anything else other than I talked about Sappho, obviously. But like, it, it, they're all men and people are always like, well, why are there no stories of women? And I'm like, well, because men wrote it down, not because there weren't stories. Mm-hmm. They just it didn't get recorded for us you know right and yeah it's like but it also just leaves so much to to be like you know theorized about in whatever satisfying way that might be done and you know at least we have Sappho and like we know there were lots of other women writing poetry we just don't have them but yeah I mean it's heartbreaking and also you know it was a society in which there were literal penis (laughs) figurines like literally (laughs) everywhere literally literally everywhere yeah (laughs) yeah on the actors just every yeah so I mean yeah (laughs) indeed so yeah no I think it just was I mean I absolutely I think some of my impulse was that as I was writing this you know I was like an early 20s um an early 20s women's college graduate who was like what do you mean (laughs) like why is this woman not in her own play and (laughs) and I was really fascinated in particular I mean you mentioned this a little earlier but with the notion of her silence when she comes Mm -hmm. back Mm -hmm. Um, partly because in the play, it's sort of just represented as an effect of having been in the underworld and, and almost like a, a ritual cleansing that's required. Mm -hmm. Like she's got to go through this process of silence because she's returned from the underworld. And I think is, I mean, I feel like I'm spoiling so much of my own retelling, but whatever, it's fine. Um, (laughs) she she's actively choosing not to speak for a period mm. of time at the at the end of of my version and i think and it's partly because she's just observing and she's observing as much as anything else i think she's observing her own life like she's observing the life that she came back to and the husband that she had been given to and and his relationship with apollo and like what's left after she came back and so i i think i was really I trust Euripides enough to not think that it's as simple as like, oh, he just didn't want to give the woman a voice, right? Like it's not, it's clearly not that, Mm -hmm. but I also, it it nonetheless results in her not having a voice in the play. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's that tension was really interesting to me as well. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's, I mean, I can only imagine like you spend that time in the underworld and then if, you know, also then you I mean in in his play the I think the assumption is kind of she's almost in like a version of limbo like right because she doesn't even technically I think she's not usually counted among people who have done a catabasis right like an actual descent and a and a what's the opposite of descent and ascent um from the underworld like she doesn't always count as one of those people who's gone there and come back because I think the idea is that like she didn't have a chance to fully go down before Heracles got her back because she was still with death. So she was still kind of Mm -hmm. like in the process, but I love the idea of it being a full catabasis, it being this experience that she goes through. And then because that means coming back is a whole different thing, right? Like coming back after you've lived in the underworld and you've (laughs) hung out, <laughs> as they would say, you know, she was yeah. friends with Persephone. They you know, were roommates. good pals. <laughs> no. Yeah, roommates. Yeah. <laughs> um, like coming back, you know, and then going back to your husband who let you die for him because he is a coward. Like, right? Yeah, what a what a thing to experience. I can imagine that a, a bit of intentional silence, as you kind yeah. of reevaluate, like, would be helpful. Yeah. And the only other thing I'll say about, about the catabasis and that structure is that I, um, I did very intentionally structure it. So there's sort of the first third where before the moment of her death, and then it is, and and again, in the new edition of the book, there's a little drawing, my little silly drawing that I made of this, um, and some other stuff about the structure, but it's like, 
I imagined it as um, a series of concentric circles cut through the middle. So it's like, it is a sort of A, B, C, D, E, D, you know, C, B, mm-hmm. A structure where she is very explicitly like, you know, encounter Cerberus, re-encounter Cerberus on the way out. Like there are oh, paired yeah. scenes that are meant to echo each other to indicate that it is really that full process of like yeah. descending and ascending, as you said. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. I, I She's just such an interesting character purely if only because we like know nothing, you know, yep. like I love, I love yep. those people and those stories so much. And I think, I think that Euripides was really doing that on purpose. Like, oh, totally. I'm, he just, the the thing that I love about him most is that he cared about his women characters. Like he wanted yes. them to be complex and have fe- thoughts and feelings and, you know, be humans. Right. <laughs> like, yeah. what a surprise. But uh, yeah, I think Alcestis is so often seen by maybe people who just don't see Euripides that way. I, they are wrong. I was going to say I think, but no, they are wrong. Um, you know, as yeah, like you're saying this kind of like model wife. And I think that's the myth that he was working off of. Yes. But the thing about the play is that people tend to forget is that their reception, just like your retelling is reception, right? Like right. Euripides was making conscious retelling choices from a pre-existing myth. And I think he was he was silencing Alcestis so on purpose, you know, yeah. to examine everything else around her or to like make commentary on her. So many different options. But yeah, Absolutely. it just it does leave so much open. I'm- yeah, and I can't remember if this came up in the um in the earlier Alcestis episodes. I think it did actually. Um the fact that, you know, it wasn't even necessarily a terribly well known myth at the time, right? No, that, like yeah that as far as we understand that it it's not one I mean there's a reason that people today are not super familiar with it either in many cases that yeah. just there aren't a ton of retellings that, of it in even in various classical sources like it's just not it's not common and so I feel like the effect of that has sort of because I feel like when you get more retellings you get more opportunities for nuance and so because there are fewer retellings it's not surprising that she's been so reduced to when you mm-hmm. go look at say um, visual representations of her, they really are just that ideal wife figure. Mm-hmm. And I, and I think that that's kind of not surprising, right? Like if you're, if you're operating from limited material that she's been sort of reduced to the, well, what, what some readers at some different periods apparently thought was the essence of the character, which is just like sacrificial, um, wife yeah yeah well it, it's exactly the same for penelope right where 95 percent of the sourcing on her is just the odyssey and so yep. like i think that if you're reading the odyssey sympathetically or you're you know reading certain adaptations of it or, or translations of it like you you see a different penelope but if you are yeah. working off of what the white men over the last 300 years have told us about penelope you know she is this ideal wife who waited for her husband very patiently and was absolutely perfect you know like so much of what we see now particularly you know people who are just coming at mythology with an interest you know versus studying it like you we are so so completely taken in by what the last 300 years have said about it versus what actually existed 2500 years ago right like absolutely yeah it, it really takes like breaking things down and looking at them you know in at their essence or just all these different ways that we can look at those things without the influence of straight white men. (laughs) And yeah. And I think that's, what's so valuable about what you do in, in, in the podcast is just that you are talking so much about the context as we, I mean, obviously the sources we have are limited, heartbreaking, et cetera, but, um, but nonetheless, like there is context and you can tell by putting different sources in, in conversation with each other, how people thought about some stories at the time. And I think it's really useful to have that because I think you can see even in our own time, I mean, for God's sake, right? Like now we're living in a time where you, you have, everything gets rebooted just like five years later (laughs) and see (laughs) how different it is even then. So like thinking about how centuries and centuries and centuries of retellings have kind of reshaped and distorted in a lot of cases, the originals and also how alien and weird a lot of the originals were. I think, I think that's <laughs> yeah. valuable. Like, I think that was one of the biggest things that interested me about this was I remember thinking about this pretty explicitly as a first contact story. 
Mm. Um, like in a science fiction <laughs> sense, you know, yeah. like this is the first time that that Alcestis is actually meeting gods in a real intensive way. Like she's sort yeah. of her grandfather's kind of appeared occasionally and she's like, shit, you know, and just tried to avoid him essentially. And now so she's as fascinated with them as they are with her in a sense um, that it's it's almost easier if you think of the gods as aliens I think, yeah. than if you try to think of them with the resonances that we have with the idea of a god. Yeah, that's my favorite way of seeing the Greek gods, though, because I think, well, not I think, absolutely Christianity has 100% influenced how we see these things. But like, yeah. you know, people always want to put this like reverence on the gods that they right. don't deserve and they didn't have back in the day like they yep. it, it wasn't about treating them like a christian god it was not about any of that like they were yeah. you know th i mean other than you know the myths about insulting gods being kind of a bad idea like otherwise <laughs> they probably saw but them pretty poorly <laughs> And it felt like it was so transactional, right? It was like, mm -hmm. you know, you, you need your relationship with the gods is about doing things the right way. It's not about how you, how you honor them in, in your heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah. And I think, I don't know, that's one of the things that I remember being the most struck by about, um, especially thinking about the time scale when you get into Rome in particular just the idea that there were rituals that were old enough that nobody at the time knew what they were for, mm. but that you still had to do them because you didn't want to piss off the gods. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing to me. Like, that's so yeah. great. The notion that, you know, within these, these civilizations that we tend to collapse in our brains into like yes. one thing. Um, that actually there were people who were like, I don't know. I don't know why we have to throw the piglet three times before we kill it. Like we, <laughs> you just have to throw the piglet. <laughs> like, and, and I think that's really lovely that, that there was uh, just a human, a human superstition that kept some of these ideas going that worked in ways that are recognizable, but also just was like so different as you were saying from anything that yeah. we associate with like Judeo Christian ways of of um building relationships with deities yeah yeah i mean rome is so interesting too like without going deep into that but their version of like because yeah. they were superstitious as all hell like in a totally oh, a different million. way than the greeks yeah yeah and you're like guys what's happening with you <laughs> like their relationship with the gods i always want to know more but like i don't even know where to begin Oof, because my entire background is greek <laughs> like yeah same but... same same yeah. I mean, I, I just, my favorite thing to emphasize, and I know I sound like a broken record, but the thing about podcasts is that people just pick up at a random place. So I have to say it every time, but like, we're talking 700 to a thousand years worth of Greek yeah. mythology happening. Like it, it was a moving and changing and adapting thing. And so, yeah, when it gets collapsed into this, like mm -hmm. cut and dry A to B story, like you lose all of what makes it interesting let alone all the complexities of of the gods themselves i mean hell like you even get things like you know my, my i always have people asking me like why is apollo the sun god but also helios and i'm like time right <laughs> like right. 500 years <laughs> so like he didn't really used to be now he is or he was then or whatever you know like yeah yeah you have to you have to account for like just the sheer volume of time and i think when you're looking at a play that's when it gets so interesting because mm. it gets flattened into this, this yes. is the myth. But it's right. not the myth. It's one guy writing a story. He was fictionalizing it. Like, yeah. we don't know. Because especially with Alcestis, like, yes. I'm trying to think of what other source we have. I I'm sure I'm sure she's in Pseudo Apollodorus. Do you know if she's one of the women that Odysseus meets in the underworld or anything? I don't For believe she reason? is. No, I didn't. Yeah. I, yeah, I don't think so. I, no, I'm pretty I feel sure like, I would remember if that were the case. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's, I mean, it's a pretty iconic moment. One of the best. Um, I'm trying, I wish I had something on hand, but yeah, I mean, she's That's not worse. mentioned often. And so no, I think there, yeah. I think that there is a Homeric reference to mm. her or Admetus. Um, but it, you know, other than that, we have Euripides' play and Euripides' play is weird. It is the weirdest Greek play without yeah. question. And so it's like, well, what was he doing with it? You know, like, and we what don't did know people what think changed. at the time? Were people yes. like, what the f hell, Euripides? You know, like, I, yeah. that, I love to think that. I also, I mean, the one final thing I'll say about like inspirations for this is the first place that I had ever encountered this story was actually the there's a Rilke poem 
that's lovely. Oh. That's about oh. her. So that's very beautiful. And, and the end of it is really striking. Let me see if I can pull it up here quickly. Yeah. Um, not the archaic torso of Apollo. Anyway, the way I remember it is that the last line of the poem is um, communicating the notion that, that Agnetus is kind of turning from her and as she's disappearing. And it says, in order to see nothing but that smile. Like she smiles mm. as she disappears. And that felt really, it felt really crystallizing of Admetus's reaction that he's like, he wants to see her in a particular way. Yeah. He wants to have this vision of her. At, I mean, I think before anyone else starts treating her as the ideal sacrificial wife, he does. And so yeah. it's this choice that he's making in terms of how to see her decision and how to see his own choices. Um, yeah. And I think that influenced the way I came to the Euripides play when I read it as well. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, it makes sense. Like so much of the play is about Admetus making poor decisions and then having to face them and figure out yeah. what to do next. Like, you know, and it's it's such I'm, it's I wish that I had read it more recently um frankly i have to read too much greek myth all the time so i did not reread it and so it's been like a year but you know he's just he's like making all these bad decisions and then feeling bad for himself and then like deciding what to do next and he just like he just really is such an interestingly messy character that it's so clear to me that like the play is really about admetus but he wants it to be about alcestis and so you know euripides named it alcestis but it reminds me kind of an, of Antigone, you know, Antigone is really the Creon yes. show, it, right. but like, exactly. it's a, yeah, like it, it's making a, sh- a show out of being, you know, about her or, you know, I think Euripides is doing it more intentionally than Sophocles, but maybe again, because I that's the thing. I think that's why Sophocles was never my favorite <laughs> because yeah. I mean, I love Antigone. It's a gorgeous play, Yeah, but it feels like, yeah, it feels like his treatment of her as kind of an instrument is not conscious. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas this is like, we're going to call it the Alcestis because Admetus would want it to seem like it is about Alcestis, yes, but exactly. it is about Admetus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I totally yeah. agree. Yeah. I mean, I always was surprised that it's um, not one of the uh, alphabet plays. Like, it is one of the ones that was preserved mm-hmm. intentionally of Euripides. And so, like, I'm so, you know, I wish I even knew where to find more commentary on it. People are always talking about commentary. And I'm like, I just, I get, I need to know more of these things. But, like, I just want to understand more about, you know, what they thought of it back then, I guess. And, like, why, why it was one of the ones they saved. Because, like, the (laughs) Helen is the other one I think of in terms of, like, the weirdest plays. And that Mm -hmm. was very much an alphabet play. Like, they did not save that on purpose. Sure. And I think, yeah, again, as I said, it's just, it's really lovely to think about somebody, you know, whoever made the choice that ended up preserving the play, just being like, well, this weird thing definitely has to get, we're going to want to read that again, because we don't know what's going on here. Yeah, yeah. Or like, we'll study it in school, because it's the weird one. (laughs) Yes, exactly. Like, it's, yeah, it's got to be like that, that bizarre one that the, that the kids are going to learn alongside Oedipus Tranos. (laughs) How I build my syllabi. (laughs) yeah good (laughs) right Uh, well I mean this has been fascinating I'm thrilled about your book I'm thrilled that there's more oh thank you women queer stories I'm just it's so cool that it was that early though too so I'm glad that it's getting republished (laughs) me too and I'm glad that it also got republished with I'll show you um whether this goes in or not but this is the original cover a Victorian painting of a Roman woman on my Greek book (laughs) Um, looks beautiful though. Loved it at the time. Great. You know, looks very Greek. Um, they've definitely gone full. (laughs) Yes. Uh, full full Gen Z. It's beautiful. But it's it's also like, yeah, there's a lot happening there. It's very gay and dramatic. I'm a big fan. So for anyone who wants to pick up the gay and dramatic new edition, I highly (laughs) recommend it has foil too. It's shiny. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So when, when is it being, when is it out? Or so is it, already? It, it was just, it was released on, I think, September 5th. So it okay. should be available everywhere. Um, it's Soho Beautiful. Press. 
Yeah. And um, yeah. And, and this new edition, like I said, has a little bit of extra deluxe special material in it. Um, the little flash fiction and stuff about the, the writing of the novel, some behind the scenes stuff. Amazing. I love that. I meant to mention this earlier, um, but the pomegranate of it all. Yes. Uh, have you heard that they also, there was a time when they believed that that was like a, um, a method of birth control? No, but I'm fascinated by that because I'm I'm super obsessed with um, Silphium. Oh yeah, the history Same. of you know. <laughs> the, the, I, I know your listeners are probably like we're all obsessed with Silphium. We all would you know like what? to know what the hell it was. Yeah, I don't talk yeah. about Rome enough, so actually they're probably sure, sure. like live. What is Silphium? What are you talking I'm like, about? This is a conversation I have with my Rome obsessed friends. But fair, yes. fair. But yes, the <laughs> mystic the mystical birth control herb that supposedly grew everywhere and was over harvested until it disappeared is my understanding. Yes. yes. Um, yeah. So yeah, that becomes, that becomes reproductive justice is definitely like a thing in uh, my 19th century book. And so I was reading oh, yeah. up on historical stuff about, about birth control and I did not encounter the pomegranates, but do you know if there's any re- like, was that explicitly linked to the Persephone story? I mean, I don't think it could be explicit in the way that we would never have a source. That's like, sure. Because Persephone in the underworld, you know, but I think, I think that it's probably not much of a leap. I'm pretty sure the problem with my podcast is that I learn all these things from all these experts and then I forget where I learned them and things just live in my brain. But I would say I'm fairly certain that it is in actually, no, not the third episode I've done with Ellie, but I think her Persephone Mm. episode where with the tablets that I mentioned, I'm pretty sure. Basically, if something had anything to do with Persephone or the underworld, it was probably taught to me by Ellie Mack and Roberts, who is lovely. (laughs) Sounds perfect. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much. This is oh my god, thank fabulous. you. I'm yeah. so glad. Is there? Do you want my listeners to follow you anywhere or learn more about anything, or do you want to talk about your other book? And by talk, I just mean like tell us the yeah. name. Yeah, absolutely. Whatever sure. kind of promotion I'll just give you a want. little spiel. Yeah, um, please. Sure. So you can find me on Instagram, which I grudgingly finally <laughs> activated in the last year <laughs> because I knew it would destroy my attention span, and it has. Um, however, it happened to me with TikTok. It's also enjoyable. Yeah, I'm still resisting intentionally, but um, Good. Ugh, it's hard. Anyway, um, yes, so you can find me on Instagram. And my second novel, Killingly, came out also with Soho Press in June. And that is a story about, based on a true story, about a student who disappeared from Mount Holyoke College, which is a women's college in Massachusetts, in 1897 and was never found. So Ooh. it is a queer historical crime novel that centers on the aftermath of her disappearance and her family looking for her and her best friend and private investigators and all of that. And I am currently working on a follow-up to that novel, which is due in a couple of years, which will trace one of those characters too and be set in queer working class New York City in 1900. Amazing. So, yeah. I know my listeners love queer stories, so I might as well share them all. That's great. Um, yes, I don't know if yeah. I will ever revisit the classical period or the <laughs> Mycenaean period in my specific case, but um, but I feel like those stories still undergird everything that I do. Like, I don't know, yeah. Just w- w- once you grow up, Delaire's like <laughs> <laughs> it's it's in you, and it's impossible for it to not to come out in your stories. Well, but especially when you're studying that time period, though, of like English lit, like Mm -hmm. the number one thing I became to my because most of my friends were in my with my English major. And so like every time we would read anything from like 1700 to 1900, it was like, Liv, there's another classical reference. Can you explain it to us? Like it it, it, they're just constant, right? Like they make up so much of mostly poetry but like my god there's just so much you can't step away they're so it was a whole other language of it was a whole other just like means of communicating extra information to each other yeah absolutely yeah yeah it's the best oh well thank you so much for doing this it's been so much fun oh thank you yeah I had a delightful time talking about it and I'm glad that I'm really excited that people might discover the book now that now that it has a genre to take a place in rather than just kind of being a little book out there on its own, um, a, a little bit too early, just just waiting, waiting for everyone to to join the uh, the retelling party, which is now bounteous and full of many options. 
Yeah. I mean, not to give the younger generation any credit too, but like, I also think it was kind of waiting for Gen Z. I, as a Canadian, I've been forcing myself to say Z instead of Z just now, but that one came Ah. out weird. But yeah, yeah, I think it was waiting for them. Like uh, just the, the way that things have changed and obviously millennials are a huge part of it as well, but like, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a much queerer world now than it was even, you know, back 10 years ago. So it's just the right time for all of this, right? Like, (laughs) fuck yes. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So no, it's, it's a delight to talk about it. And and thank you for giving me the opportunity to introduce more people to it. I'm thrilled. Alcestis, like of all people, I was so excited. Yeah, exactly. Oh, nerds, thank you so much for listening. Uh, Really, really fun conversation. It was such a joy talking to Catherine, and I'm thrilled for you all to hear it now, even if I recorded it like uh, four months ago. Really, it was so much fun. And I just really think, I'll be honest, I haven't read the book yet, but Alcestis, Alcestis is this character that just is so interesting, so lacking in mythological sources, and yet we have this incredible play by Euripides that is so weird and specific and this idea that she just comes back from the dead and doesn't speak a damn word. I think she is so ripe for a novel, such a unique story, one that so few people really know about in the wider realm of Greek myth. Such a thrill. So it was a joy talking to Catherine and if you are interested, check out that book. I have uh, linked to Catherine's website in the episode description. Thank you all so much for listening. Let's Talk About Myths Baby is written and produced by me, Liv Albert. Michaela Smith is the Hermes to my Olympians, my assistant producer. I am doing this off of memory now. I've read these credits so many times. Laura Smith is the production assistant and audio engineer. The podcast is part of the iHeart Podcasts Network. Help me continue bringing you the world of Greek mythology and the ancient Mediterranean by becoming a patron. Visit patreon.com slash mythsbaby or click the link in this episode's description. (sighs) I love having these conversations. I love having so many recorded that I can just pop this in when my life falls apart and I have to leave the country in an effort to stay sane. Thank you all so much for listening. I am Liv and I love this shit.